All right. Welcome to the Quest for Excellence podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Montreal. I am joined today by Amy Lynn Osterback. Um, Amy is the owner of Mays & Company. It's a real estate and coaching business that's affiliated with the Keller Williams brand. And she's worked uh, with Keller Williams in some capacities since 2004 in various leadership roles. Uh, she's also kind of a fitness nut. She's a big focus in health and wellness and is a CrossFit trainer and also is just kind of an all-around go-getter and, and positive person. So, Amy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. Absolutely. I just want to give a little bit of background about how I know you, how you know why why you're here, at least in the beginning part. You, We know each other from way back. It's been, you know, we talked a couple of days ago, just to kind of catch up. And it's been about 20 years since we even <laughs> were on each other's radar, aside from maybe a occasional Facebook pop-up or something like that. But I'm you're- really happy. Plus or minus a few, uh, I believe it was 1991, Jeff. Well, oh, was it really that long? Yeah, it, it, it's been wow. that long. Unbelievable. Well, either way, it's been over 20 years since we've had any <laughs> kind of contact. And she was a, a friend of my sister's back in the day. That's really where I know her. We were acquaintances there. Um, so we weren't, you know, really close friends. Didn't know a whole lot about you, which I'm going to find out a bit about today. But you know, I had spent some time around you, with you, and from what I remember back in the day, you were always a very positive person, you always had a big smile on your face, and that kind of stuck with me. I, I mentioned that to you when we talked, and that was real, you know, some things just stick with people from your past, and I remember that group, that group of people, and um, you were kind of the positive one at that time, so if, if before we talk about what you do for a living, and your coaching business, and how you help other real estate agents, and, and that kind of thing, um, I think it's important to talk about kind of where we come from. So before anything to do with me or my sister, you know, just talk about a little bit about your early life. I don't know if you have any brothers and sisters or you know exactly where you were born. You can start wherever you want and go wherever you want. So the floor is yours with that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, was born and raised in good old East Detroit, Michigan. Um, hmm. I have um, an older sister. She's four years older than me. Uh, my parents uh, have been married for almost 50 years. Wow. Um, they, uh, I say they were high school sweethearts, but they got pregnant with my sister at 17. So they were kind of forced into marriage, you know, back in the day. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we grew up um, and I was kind of always labeled that bad kid, if you will. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh, pulled out of uh, public school in first grade and uh, had to go to a Catholic school. My older sister, you know, spent her uh, education in the uh, East Detroit public schools. And I uh, graduated from St. Clement High School is actually where we met. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, um, you know, my my dad was always of the belief that, you know, he told me if you wanted to live in my house after high school, you needed to go to college. My parents didn't have a college education and they believed in that wholeheartedly. So I kind of said uh, F you and moved out at 17 um, and did my own thing for a while, quite some time. You know, um, I had no direction whatsoever. I had no clue about anything about what life was about. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I guess. I, I don't know how far you want me to go into the story. I could go to, like fast forward to where I am now. Well, maybe not that quick. I guess. Uh, a, where, did you stay in the area when when you when you left when you said f you? Uh, you know, I guess. Kinda... So I actually, you know, I graduated at the age of seventeen. I was a, a early bird, and um, my girlfriend at the time. We had just lost a a dear friend of ours. Uh, She was killed in a car accident and it kind of rocked my friendship world. And um, one of my girlfriends moved up north to a tiny little town called Cross Village that sits Hmm. between Petoskey and Mackinac. And if you're ever in town, it's called Legs Inn, which is amazing because I moved up there (laughs) and actually worked up there for the summer. Uh, And then I moved back home um, after a season up there. And when I mean back home, I mean back to the Detroit area and then moved in with two girlfriends uh, into the Warren area. It was awesome. Her mom let us rent this amazing like 1500 square foot ranch with an in-ground pool in the backyard for like 200 wow. bucks a month a piece. So mm. it was awesome, right? It was 18, 
no, you know, living my own life, doing my own thing, getting in lots of trouble. <laughs> now, you don't have to mention names, but did that? Did I know those the people you were living with at the time? Oh yeah. When you were eighteen, okay, okay, yeah. You don't have to go into who it was, but I have an idea. I can only imagine the kind of action you guys are going to do. So, okay, cool. So, um, this is a good starting point because the story from here could go into just abysmal disarray, or <laughs> how you led into being, you know, a positive, successful, you know, fit, energetic, you know, go getter kind of person. So, yeah, talk just wherever you want to go from there. I guess before you got into. The whole real estate thing and and uh, discovered Keller Keller Williams. Uh, before that, you know anything about that time, uh, that formative time, it, at the end of your teenage years and your early twenties, kind of how did that progress? Yeah, so you know it's interesting because it, during my last six years is re- when I really have made uh, tremendous growth, and during that time, I've really been blessed to have um, some experiences that have allowed me to look back on a past and say, okay you know, where did some of these things happen at and and how was I living and who I was then and who I'm becoming now, right? So Mm -hmm. I look back at all of that and uh, about the age of, I think I was right right before I turned 19, um, I had all, I've always been in the bar industry. Okay. I started bussing tables. That was my first job bussing tables at the age of 13 and it was great (laughs) money, right? Getting tips and all this. So I've always been in that hospitality industry. And um, I, I remember I wanted to get out of it, right? At some point I was like, okay, this is like, I saw the people around me and I was like, this is really not, you know, where I want to be in in 20 years. And I really didn't want to go to school at that time. So I got a job at a landscaping company of all things um, as a secretary. Mm. I was making a whole $6.50 an hour, right? I was like, this is great. So (laughs) good to go. Yeah, it was awesome. So I always kept my weekend jobs, you know, in and out of the restaurant industry. But I thought, okay, I I can at least build a a resume doing this. So I ended up working uh, for Backer Landscaping for almost 10 years. And Hmm. um, I had a great mentor. My boss was phenomenal. I learned a ton from him. And then um, in 2001, I met my um, uh, a man who used to be my husband. Um, and uh, was pregnant in 2003. And that's when I said, okay, I had always had a love for real estate. And um, I decided at that time, you know, that I I was going to be a mom and I needed to look for a different role. I wanted to be able to stay home with my kids. um, And I thought real estate would be the avenue to do that. I've always loved houses. So get my real estate license. That'll be easy. Yeah, right. So I got my real estate Hmm. license in 04 and I did pretty good my first few years in the business. Uh, And then 08, 09 happened, right? Uh, Yeah. The Great Recession. And I think, you know, I was waiting for it. Yeah. You know, Detroit got hit harder than most of the country at that time. And we we know we lived through it. Right. So uh, at that time, my then husband was in car sales and I was in real estate, right? So our household took like a double whammy hit. We went from, you know, together collectively making well over six figures to making nothing like over. Yeah. Right. So um, we both. um, Oh, and I should say during this time, too, I had gone back to school a little bit and started taking some classes. Um, I've always it's funny. I'm very inquisitive by nature. I love learning. I just didn't like um, the path that um, I was like force fed education, right? I want to learn about mm-hmm. things that I want to learn about, not things that we're forced to learn about. So uh, real estate crashed, car sales crashed. We both went back to school, reinvented ourselves. Uh, he went to, and we strategically planned this out. He went to U of M for finance. He was going to be the money guy. I finished my degree at Wayne State for education, which happened to be in health education. Uh, So Mm -hmm. when he graduated, we uh, moved to Tennessee. He actually moved a few months prior to, I still had my uh, semester of student teaching I did. So he moved before I did. And then when I graduated in December of 2011, uh, packed up the kids and we moved to Tennessee. And uh, we were there for two years. And then I, you know, I was, I allowed myself to be in an extremely toxic uh, relationship. I had, I look back on that now and I'm like, wow, I was such a, a hurt young girl with no self-worth, no self-esteem. 
And uh, I allowed myself to, to stay in a, a very toxic relationship. And um, living in Tennessee, I, I it was like one day the switch just flipped and my eyes were wide open. And um, I, I decided I had had enough. And I called my mom and dad and I said, I need to come home and I need to come home now. And mm-hmm. six days later, uh, me and two kids and two dogs in a moving truck uh, were in the driveway of my parents' house. And that was at 37, right? So I went from, moved out at 17, and now here I am at 37. 20 years later. Yeah, yeah. living <laughs> in my parents' basement with two kids. And I remember this, you know, distinctly. It was in August, it was actually August 8th, because that's my Independence Day. And um, I reached out to my old professor at Wayne State, and I was like, look, can I get in the grad program? Um, you know, I'm moving back home. I don't think I'm going to be able to find a teaching job. School starts in two weeks, right? So she was she was awesome. She was like, absolutely, Amy. Um, you can start the grad program. In the meantime, check out this link. So she sent me a link for a school that was hiring for a health and PE teacher. And I actually had my job interview the day after I moved back home. And I ended wow. up landing that job. And it was at Henry Ford in Detroit, which was great because it kept me busy. Well, when you move from out of state, uh, you have to wait six months to file for divorce. And then when you have kids, you have to file, you have to wait another six months. So my divorce took like 18 months, right? So Mm. here I am, I'm like, yes, I got a job. Well, you know, teachers, especially first year teachers in a new district, they don't make diddly squat, okay? So here I am, 37, living in my parents' basement with two kids making $35,000 a year. And, um, you know, that was, that went on for about almost probably a year. And I woke up one day and I was like, this is not my fucking life. And, like, I, and this was 2014, you said right around there, right? Yeah, what, 2014, you, almost right, 2015. Yep. And, okay. I'm just trying to stay with the timeline. Yeah. So I was just like, this, this is not my life. Like, oh my gosh, I did not sign up for this. Who, who am I? Like, what is happening? And mind you, um, you know, I being that I was in the in the restaurant and the bar industry for so long, I've always been a drinker, right? So through my divorce and through that time, I kind of found my solace in a bottle of Jack Daniels. And, yeah. and I'll circle back to why that's important in the story. Um, so I met with a girlfriend of mine and here I am with my sob story, like Jamie, like I, I just am I'm miserable. And she was like, Amy, get your real estate license again. And I was like, duh, why didn't I think of that? Right? So when you let your real estate license lapse in Michigan, you either have to take the 40 hour class again, or you have to take the exam. And I was like, well, I'm not taking that test. I'll take the class again. So I signed up to take the class and it was on Saturday for eight weeks. And during those eight weeks, I was still (laughs) teaching school full time coaching CrossFit two times a week, bartending on the weekends and raising two kids on my own. Um, I have wow. full physical and legal custody of my kiddos. When I left, my ex-husband just went on a downhill spiral. So in, in that time, I, I started communicating with people like, hey, I'm getting back in the real estate business. Well, I ended up penning eight deals my first quarter back in the business while I was just doing this like part, part time. Right. So my mm-hmm. why was my drive to be successful was so big. So um, I you know, I, I got the wheels turning and I found success real quick in the real estate industry again. And, and KW is a great platform, right? We have systems and models where you can just plug into and you follow a system and you follow a model and you're persistent and results follow, right? So I'm like, okay, I can do this. So, uh, uh, this was 2015 now. Yeah. The- Still twenty mid twenty fifteen around there based on and and let me let me I don't no, mean to cut you off because I'm, I'm loving what you're saying but I have questions. so many nuggets <laughs> yeah and questions and, and things that I'm, I and I don't want to interrupt but I at this point I can't help myself <laughs> so uh, initially because you kind of slipped it in but where did the um, I guess the initial influence for the real estate come in like like you just said you just look like home like beautiful homes and you know like looking at them online and pricing houses that kind of thing or was there someone who introduced you into real estate in the very very beginning um no you know that was back in 2000 december 2003 is when i originally got licensed um and it was just something that kind of always tugged at me 
Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I don't remember exactly what it was. I don't I don't have like an aha moment where like this is what I was going to do. But I just always thought of, you know what, I can see myself doing that. Um, there was probably a part of me that thought it was easy, right? Because we only see that like that iceberg, right? You only see the top piece of it. Oh, I can do that. Um, so, yeah, I just think it was, you know, something that kind of always tugged at me. Gotcha. The reason I ask that usually, or not, not all the time, but uh, when when people either, I don't know, I don't, if I would describe it as rock bottom, where you weren't in your most ideal place in your life, sometimes what, what kind of gets their, their hooks into us is what we're passionate about. It might be something that we haven't done in a while. And as m- much as you might have not been dreaming about being a, a real estate agent since you were a little kid, it was definitely something that you could see yourself doing. And, and at that point in your life, and especially how it took off so quickly, that that must have felt so good at that point. You know, like with all this other stuff going on, and you're obviously focused on fitness. And, and speaking of that, how did you get into the whole uh, CrossFit fitness world? Where did How did that interweave yeah, into so, your story? Yeah, so good question. So I can tell you, though, you know, I do remember when I was bartending, I had so many of my regulars that tell me, like, Amy, you would be so good at sales. And I would always say back to them, like, I am in sales, right? Like, this is what I do. And so I probably thought at some point, like, okay, what can I go sell and make a lot of money, (laughs) right? (laughs) So um, CrossFit entered my world in um, 2010, before I moved to Tennessee. So um, I have been CrossFitting for almost 10 years, which is crazy. And lo and behold, it was from Facebook. I don't know. I don't even remember her name, but there was yep. a girl that we went to high school with. And her name was Janelle. Um, and I actually did not get along with her. But for some reason, we became Facebook <laughs> friends. And I saw she posted something about CrossFit on Facebook. And I've always been, you know, a fitness nut. I've always been in the gym. I've always taken great care of myself, uh, played basketball in high school, even though I had to sit my senior year because my grades were so horrible. Um, but, you know, I was like, CrossFit, what is this? Like. I've always been attracted to the cultish things, right? Like the the things like that are the the badass things to do. Like, okay, what is this? Should I should go check this out? And I was hooked from day one. Uh, and then, yeah, I've always been interested. I, I maybe offline or after the uh, interview, I'll want to hear more about that because I'm just recently, due to some stuff I've been doing, have been going hard with with fitness and working out every single morning. You know, maybe maybe one day a week, maybe a break, but. Uh, so anyway, keep going. Yeah, so, so when, when you I got moved into that. to Tennessee, I actually got certified uh, as a CrossFit coach when I was living there. Just It made sense, right? My degree is in health education. Yeah, I was yeah. a health and PE teacher. So um, it, it just it was a fit for me, right? And, and it was my escape. When I go to CrossFit, I'm not a mom. I'm not a coach. I'm not a real estate agent. Like That's my time to just leave it all on the floor and be mm-hmm. in my zone, right? Mm-hmm. That's my happy place. Quick question about that. Could you be, uh, if, if one wanted to, could you be a full-time CrossFit trainer or make a decent um, living? I don't really think the trainers make a ton of money from it. Um, no, it, the, no. It, even when you own a CrossFit gym, most people that own a, yeah, that was most next people question. that are, own an affiliate have um, a, another, you know, income that they make a living from. It's really just a passion. Gotcha, gotcha. That's what it seems like. I, I just wasn't sure. I don't know much about the business model or how it works. If it was like a, like you said, the affiliate program, that kind of thing. Well, okay, cool. So that kind of, that, that makes sense if you've always been fit. And it's such an important thing. I've been listening to some podcasts lately and, and uh, one with Mike Dillard yesterday talking about health and fitness. And it's so important to be fit before you can do anything to have maximum performance. So that's like the first and to be listening, if you want to be be successful, start working out. Go for go for a jog every morning. And or start look, walking. Yeah, you know, get off your we butt. don't have our wellness. We don't have anything, right? Because we can have all right. the money in the bank. We can have all the success we want. We can, you know, even if it if it's not if your if your idea of success isn't even centered around money, it doesn't matter. But if you don't have your wellness and your health, you don't have anything. Not in this physical mm-hmm. world, anyways. <laughs> No, no. And, you know, people don't realize, you know, basic things like drinking enough water daily and, and getting enough car to get your heart racing, little things like that. And your diet, they, they affect. It's not just hereditary if you get cancer or not. Your, your diet and what you consume is so important. So that you know, we could have a two hour yeah. podcast about that. But let me, let me go down because it's really so important. So at least everybody heard that it's it's the fundamental foundation of being a successful person. You have to be fit and take care. And really, I remember hearing years ago, it's the first 
form of self-control, mm. deciding what or what you do not put into your body. It's the one freedom that we all have, mm -hmm. right? You know, unless you're a slave or something. I mean, you, you can control what you eat. So if you can't do that, probably not going to be a great owner, or business person, or parent, Hunter. and so on. Uh, anyway, so, so okay, cool. The You found yeah. Keller Williams. This, this was... 2014, you, 2015, right? So Yep. You, you you got first quarter with them. You said you did amazing right when you started, and and you at this point you were just an agent. Correct. You weren't really uh, you were just yeah, getting so started, right? Okay, absolutely. so carry on. Where did it go from there over the next we couple of years? We had um, you know in the Keller Williams model, you have an ownership group, and they select one person to kind of um, be the operating partner, if you will. And then we got a new mm -hmm. uh, operating partner. And they were looking for a new team leader of the office. And the team leader is like uh, equivalent to a CEO of a company, right? So um, our gotcha. OP uh, approached me and he said, we had a like an announcement party for him, right? And he was like, you, you should put your name in the team leader hat. And I was like, huh, okay, you know, I will do that. So at the time, I had no idea what I was signing up for, right? But... Going into leadership with Keller Williams is a rigorous process, all right? They have so many systems and models. At that time, they were doing something called an AVA, where they give you like this hour test and you they fit you in this metric. And it took like three months of an interview process, okay? It was not a short time. Mm. So um, during this time, I got sick. And um, I remember one day I was teaching and, you know, cause I was still managing both at, the, at this time. And um, I had this horrible pain in my stomach and I don't go to the doctors. Uh, I, I'll go once a year to get my blood work and everything else done, but everything else I'm like, ah, you just tough it out, right? Like, you'll be, I'll be fine. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh shit, well, yeah, I I'm agree. interviewing for this team leader role. I'm gonna lose my insurance. Like, I better go to the doctors and make sure everything is right. So I go to the doctors and by this time, like the pain was gone and I'm like, it, it was probably nothing, right? Like maybe it was a gas bubble, who knows? <laughs> so. He's like, you know what, Amy? He's like, you're fit. You're in good health. We're going to give you an ultrasound just to be sure. And I'm like, okay. So he writes me a script for an ultrasound. I go home. That ultrasound paper sat on my my dresser for weeks. And again, here I am thinking like, oh shit, I like the, the interview process is moving along. I better make sure this is okay, right? So I see this paper one day and I was like, finally, I'll make the appointment. So I make the appointment. They call me back the same day. They were like, Amy, you need to come in for your results. And I'm like, oh shit, right? Like that's never good. So mm. I ended up having no. a, a pseudo cyst on my pancreas, an eight centimeter by eight centimeter cyst in my pancreas. And if you've ever seen me, like I'm a small wow. stature girl, right? I'm five three, 125 pounds. There's no room for anything in, in my abdomen, right? So Yeah, that's big. <laughs> um right. I had to the I had to end up getting a stint put in. So this kind of delayed my hiring process, right? Because I didn't want to change my health insurance during this time. So um, I ended up, uh, you know, everything was fine. It took an extra six weeks, no big deal. Well, I became the team leader. And then in Keller Williams is a company based on education and training, right? We are actually the number one training organization. We've been given that title four out of five years by the training magazine. Um, you know, and we're up against everybody hmm. like Best Buy, Google, Amazon, Costco. Yeah, that was the next question yeah, was across the whole. Wow, that's brokers. impressive. It's, it's companies, period. So, and my degree is in education, right? So, what a great alignment. So, when I took this yeah, team yeah. leader role, I got sent, I was flying like every four weeks to go to this training, go to this training. So, I was everywhere. Um, and lo and behold, one day I'm in Austin, Texas, where our headquarters is. And I'm at this uh, training called FSO, which is Franchise Systems Orientation, right? Getting acclimated to how the franchises ran. And um, I'm outside sitting on a park bench and these two guys are out there and I strike up a casual conversation with them. Five minute conversation. And the gentleman asked me, he's like, so what's your five year plan? Which is a huge question in Keller Williams, right? It's just that question that we love to ask people. Mm. How big is your vision, right? Is mm -hmm. really what we're asking somebody. So I said, you know yeah, what, yeah. honestly, it's really to get back to warmer weather. I lived in Nashville for a few years. I'm not cut out for the cold weather. And he kind of like half jokingly said, well, like, oh, hey, I, you know, well, I just happened to own the number one Keller Williams franchise in the state of California. So, you know, kind of chuckled and I was like, yeah, maybe one day. Well, we became Facebook friends. And then a couple weeks later, I saw him post on his Facebook page 
that he was looking for a team leader. And I half joking, I commented oh. with a raise your hand emoji, right? Like half jokingly. Well, lo and behold, six months later, here I was moving my kids to California uh, to take this opportunity that presented itself. And Jeff, I almost didn't take it. I went through the whole interview process oh, again. Man. And I was like, this fear showed up, right? Like, who am I? I'm new to this role. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, why would they pick me? I can't do this. This is the number one office in the entire state of California. It's in the top 25 of all Keller Williams out of 800 market centers. Why me, right? I'm like, no way, I can't go. I'll, I'll make a fool of myself. And again, Facebook, I'm telling you, I love Facebook. Uh, Oh yeah, I, I used to hate it. I, I used to honestly despise it, and it was more of that hoity-toity kind of. I'm better than that kind of well, thing. It's too, it's amazing. It's a great tool, and it, or it can turn into a bunny trail. Yeah, not, exactly. Right. So of course, my, like my fiance still will not have an account because of that thing years ago. It just got so wrapped up and like consumed anything, her life. So right? it can be dangerous, but it's a great right. tool. So yeah, right. I, I was on Facebook one day, and here floats this Prince EA. If you guys don't know who he is. Google Prince EA, no regrets, and do yourselves a favor and watch this five minute video. That video changed my life, right? He, Prince EA is a phenomenal motivational speaker and he was just talking about interviewing mm -hmm. old people. And you know, it's the one thing that everybody regrets is like the what ifs, right? Like, why didn't I take that chance? Why yes, didn't I yes. do this? And I saw this video and I was like, that's it, I'm going because I will never live my life with what ifs. If I don't do this, I will always forever remember and think like, what if I would have went? What would my life be like, right? So I said, fuck it again. And I packed my kids up and <laughs> we moved to Long Beach, California. And uh, we were there so for cool. two years. And, you know, again, I, I say California was the rock that I needed it to be for me. I found my soul again. Uh, living in California and it was beautiful. It was everything I needed it to be. Uh, my kids were miserable living there. So I always say I moved to California for me and then I moved back for them. So, however, during living there, um, you know, here I am running this office. I, I did a, a, a phenomenal job. I, had a, a, I surrounded myself with some big thinkers. I had three of Gary Keller's top 100 in my office. Um, what our RD, um, who is our regional director of Southern California, he owns like 35 Keller Williams market centers, right? Phenomenal guy. His name's Paul Morris. He's written a great book. It's called Wealth Can't Wait, which I also highly recommend uh, if you like investing in real estate. So Paul, Paul did um, a team leader mastermind once a month in the Beverly Hills office for all of his team leaders. And I remember him saying one time, if you ever want to change your life, get a mindset coach. And I was like, hmm, took note of it. I was like, what's a mind? That sounds interesting. Like, what is that, right? So a few months later, I was uh, at a another Keller Williams training in San Antonio. And Keller Williams has an organization called MAPS. It's Mega Agent Productivity Systems. And they're the, age they're the coaches for... Uh, top producing agents and team leaders all over the country, right? We have 200,000 people within our organization and there's about 200 MAPS coaches who coach people to run big businesses. So I'm at this training and there's like transformational coaching there, mindset coaching. So I could go on for a whole nother hour story about how I landed my coach, but we'll say <laughs> Yeah. So long story short, I ended up getting the number one coach in like the entire organization. And um, he literally somebody had somebody died. And that was how he had an opening on his roster. Her name's Christine Jeez. Sims. Like she she's always in my heart. Right. So true story. So I approached mm -hmm. him at this and I, you know, was this young. I here here I am like, what do I need to do to earn the right for you to coach me? Um, so he had me write him this letter and the only coaching time slot that he had available was at 6 a.m. on Fridays. Well, he lives in Austin and I live in California and the difference between central time and Pacific time. Yeah. So yeah, it's quite yeah, a bit. First it's two hours. Yeah, yeah. I woke up at 3.30 in the morning on Fridays. I'd go jump in my pool <laughs> to wake up and then I'd be ready for my 4 a.m. call Love with it. him. Um, and let me uh yeah let me let me stop you right there if that's okay 
um because again this for part of the reason i'm doing this series amy is um you know stories like yours and to really dissect that just a couple seconds here what you just described from when you talked about and i've mentioned this on a couple of my podcasts that the number one regret on people's deathbeds is that they didn't take action not the things that they did do but they you know the, the regrets of the what ifs so uh, everybody listening and, and again the point of the series and this whole show is to get people to the point where they believe in themselves enough to take that next step because sometimes when you take those risks you're not in the right mindset you're not in the right mind space but it's very important and a lot of times with the shiny object syndrome and get rich quick schemes and everything online and facebook and instagram it, it can be easy to take those risks or spend some money when you're not ready yet right so it sounded like at that point and and this is an important distinction you had that oh, imposter yeah. syndrome moment oh, before yeah. you decide right before you decided to go to california and you like who well, who am i to do this and i don't want to really talk about myself too much but let me tell you a quick story i worked for the same franchise for over eight years that helped them grow from like four or five stores to over 15 you know it was kind of like the fixer they moved me around to do shit. i started to build my confidence when i used to be kind of a you know social anxious kind of person all that and was really feeling great about myself and my life and had a pretty good mentor at that time. And we decided to uh, build stores in Toledo or take over the market here where I live now. And we bought it, took over five stores. I was still running locations in Michigan. And I remember, this is literally how it happened. I was standing one day in one of my new stores as a GM and my, my big boss, my mentor, we were talking about Toledo. And I said, hey, it'd probably be cool to work at a, a campus, Jimmy John. So, well, I just gave out where it doesn't matter. You can go look it up. But, Go work at a campus store. It'd be awesome. Like, you know, young people vibing football games and all that. And it was a pretty big school. And he's like, oh, really? Within four days, I'm in a hotel in downtown Toledo taking over a location. That was not in the plan at all. There was no prior to that. And I said, screw it, man. Let's just take a risk. End of my story. Mm -hmm. It's where I met my future wife. I further built upon my, my confidence and the person that I'm, I am now. And it, it was an amazing choice. So I would have regretted that forever, even if I would have had some sort of success in that parallel universe. It's the risk that we do not take that end up weighing us down in life because we, we later on we wish, damn, I wish I would have at least tried it, right? So that that's incredible. Um, and, and so carry on. I want to hear how you went from this yeah. this coach, this letter yeah, from so there, where that took you, you from that, there. Right? Because this risk of moving to California, it literally saved my life. All right. Like, I mean, figuratively speech, speaking and like seriously so remember how i told you about my pancreas right so um i had to have yeah. a follow-up mri done the year after i had my stint taken out so i'm living in california at this time in so many synchronicities to this story right like divine intervention at its finest so um my mm. cousin actually worked for boston scientific who was the manufacturer of the stint that was put in my pancreas right like how crazy is that and, hmm. right so she got yeah, me in contact wild. with the doctor out there. It was absolutely amazing. So I go for my follow-up visit, have to have an MRI done. My pseudocyst is gone, but now I have a cluster of cells on my pancreas. So I had to have a biopsy done. And when I got the results back, there was a component in there called mucinin, which is precancerous. So mm. when you hear pancreas and cancer, mm. that never ends well, right? So I had this world-renowned um, liver transplant surgeon do an eight-hour robotic surgery on me to remove uh, a third of my pancreas. So I really believe that I would. The, the doctor that I had here in Michigan that took care of my pancreas, he never gave me a biopsy in the first place when I had the pseudocyst. Um, it, it was just not good care. So I truly believe with all of my being that um, that really saved my life. Okay. Also, getting Ron as my coach. No. No, well, I was gonna, I'm just going to say getting oh, I'm Ron sorry, as my coach also saved my life. Ron, is, he does a lot of energy work, okay? And through him, I was introduced to the the works of Earl Nightingale and Dr. David Hawkins and so many other influential people that really believe um, in quantum physics, in energy, in the law of attraction, mm -hmm. in manifestation. Um, and this really laid the groundwork uh, for who I've become and am continuing to become and my coaching uh, company and the, the agents and the people that I coach now, right? So, so much of that groundwork was done uh, in California. So it, it was an amazing opportunity. And then, you know, it's funny because 
when I decided uh, to move back home, I also took another risk, right? I'm like, okay, well, I became a MAPS coach during that time. <laughs> you know, I'm like, why not? I can do this. So, um, which is like unheard of mm-hmm. for a new team leader to do in the amount of time that I was with Keller Williams. So I became a MAPS coach. And then um, I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm moving back home. And I was like, okay, well, here I am. I'm moving back home jobless and homeless again, right? Like half joking, but it was true. So um, I yeah, yeah. moved back home again, uh, kind of landed at my parents' house, very temporary. I was only there for 60 days because I was looking for a house. And at the time, um, the inventory was super low again. And uh, there were only like less than 30 houses on the market where I wanted to buy so I could have my kids in the same school district. So um, I moved home. I aligned myself with the number one Keller Williams office uh, in the region of Michigan and North Ohio. I was a team leader for a year and then just kind of self-discovered. There's a lot of... um, of stress that comes along with being a team leader, right? You're the CEO of the organization. And I just, I was recognizing that I wasn't getting a lot of joy from my job. It seemed heavy and I don't like things that seem heavy. I want to have fun. I'm a free spirit. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Oh, excuse me. I just kind of self-discovered through this time that I love coaching and that is what I want to do. I went to, um, uh, a few um, growth, self-growth, self-development platforms, uh, one being Landmark. I've gone through the Landmark Forum, Advanced Landmark Workshops, and then uh, more recently, I got my Master Practitioner in NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming and Hypnosis. So through that, I just nice. kind of self-discovered, like, look, I love the coaching thing, and that's all I want to do. I just want to work in my lane. So uh, a year ago, I stepped into a full-time coaching role, and then that's all I've been doing. I, you know, I have a, a small database that I work with for um, buyers and sellers in real estate because I, I love, especially first-time home buyers. There is just like nothing more precious than helping somebody uh, become a homeowner. It it, it it fills up my cup. Yeah. Um, and then I get to coach agents to build a big business, and I I now it's like I really live my life by design. Um, at all times. I love that. Uh, you, you know, you're in complete control of what's going on in your life and, and not, not that you're in control at all times. We kind of live in a chaotic world, but it sounds like you've, you've got a good control of where you're going. And a couple things about the coaching, I can fully relate to that. And it, it's, uh, it sounds like it's really what you want to do. And as much as it feels great to do, you know, those first time home buyers, but coaching people and getting them to have lasting impact on their immediate income and then for their families and their family's legacy like you're building that for people if you're coaching them and i'm assuming it's not just real estate yeah. coaching this is just it's, life yeah, mindset it's coaching person. it's the whole shebang right it's because it's uh, we believe like i always say yeah, cool so um, I, you know we have a saying here and it's your business grows to the extent that you do so you can't grow your business to a level that you yes. wanted to have in your life unless you're also growing who you are and how you're showing up. Oh, it, Absolutely. it has to be a constant evolution. And it's where most people become stagnant. We all know them in our lives. And, and it, what, I don't even want to go into the reasons why. We could sit here for an hour and talk about cognitive dissonance and all that. And you know, <laughs> can't teach an old dog new tricks that whole thing. But, that's not the point. You, you know, you know how it is. But you have to constantly be learning, and the the once you can accept mm-hmm. that you there is no arrive. finish line, right? There's no perfection. It's just every single day. And if you embrace that, and then then when that happens, you start to realize that when you make a mistake or when some shit doesn't go your way, that just gives you a chance to grow. So you get excited, <laughs> like when you make mistakes, and they don't become these heavy things that weigh on you. That's been really prevalent in my life, which has led into. I, I would be remiss not to at least mention this. What's got me going, and and the only reason I mention it is because of the whole coaching thing. And um, if that's your calling, which it sounds like it is, and I know it is for me, just recently, uh, again, I don't want to talk too much about me, but just recently I had, it's just more of a reach out, hey, do you need some advice kind of thing? 
um, I had my first coaching commission ever, mm. and I wasn't even really trying. You know, I, I'm taking what I'm doing in, in phases and this podcast and connecting and networking and learning from smart people and, you know, how they became the better versions of themselves. That's why I'm doing this now, but I was just blown away. So in the, I'm, I'm involved with an educational program called Entre Institute. It's online. It's really what got me going, what put mm. the, the fire underneath my ass. And one of their elements, they teach uh, affiliate marketing, running your own agency for any kind of agency you'd like, and then coaching. And uh, it, I've been really drawn to that. And I'd, lo I'd love to hear more about what you do, but I, I have a couple of questions for you because we got about maybe 15, 20 minutes left. I want to respect your time. And I want to dive into a couple of things. Um, I want to really pick your brain on how you, how you see the future going, both for yourself and then for what I'm about to reference. I want to talk about something first, though, the whole education <laughs> system. I meant to mention this earlier on. Yeah, yeah, you brought up something earlier. I know you feel the same way. Ironically, I also went to Wayne State for a little while. I really like going there. It was kind of a weird, weird campus in the, in the middle of the hood, but it was really beautiful and it was nice. I like Wayne State. It was a great school, but it's come up on every single one of my my podcasts, um, even with like my fiance and the, our education system now. The the difference between the potential without a degree compared to the potential with a degree. It's so different than it was 50, 60 years ago. And we're in a system where colleges are subsidized, that, you know, there's tax incentives to go for, it's it's such a system that to just stop it would, would really jack up our system, right? But that does not take away from the fact that doing kind of what you did, you didn't get it, you know, decide to get away from the whole nine to five gig. You did that for long enough. Now you're running your whole world and inspiring people to kind of become what you did, right? That had nothing to do with, sure, your health and fitness was a huge part of your life. You do CrossFit, but uh, I don't think that you got the tools to do what you're doing now just from going to college. You've always been this person. You know, you've got to grow into who you are from the experiences in your life. It wasn't just because of a college degree. I would put it more on taking a risk in your life and moving to California and meeting your mentor and getting involved in that program. I think that was more of a step forward than, than getting a degree. So I, I know you agree. If you want to talk about that for a minute, because it's getting to the, to the point now, it's like, damn, you're criminal. The, the potential and, and even companies you know like Google and, and Apple, they're not requiring yeah, college, college degrees for a lot of positions a anymore. If you've got a portfolio piece. or... <laughs> That's it. It's it. It's you it. And look, it? you want to be a doctor... I mentioned right. this. Yes. If it's a, a specific focus skill set you need that you can't get from YouTube or from a guru or from someone like yourself, like you can't teach me how to operate on a heart. I got to go to school for that. Understood. But the whole treadmill of like you mentioned when we first got on here, go to school, blah, 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 go to college, get married, kids. It's just not how it is anymore. Um, so anyway, that, that's just, I had to mention that. It sounds like you agree. I do, right? The, um, this then is this the next thing, part. Though. I value education just as well as I value yes. fitness, okay? Just because I'm a CrossFit instructor and I choose to do CrossFit, though, doesn't mean that everybody that's looking to be well and be fit needs to do CrossFit. Same thing with education. I value education. There are more yeah. ways to get educated than going to college and earning a degree. It, and there's nothing wrong if that's your path and what you choose to do. Amen. Go rock it out. The success, though, in a drive mm -hmm. that people have to be success, to be successful um, and to watch things come to fulfillment does not happen uh, sitting in a classroom. Education, though, is paramount. You have no. to know how to educate yourself, how to educate others, how to share ideas, how to collaborate, how to work in a team environment, right? How to be independent, interdependent, how to be an entrepreneur and how to be an entrepreneur yeah, so, so in the entrepreneur's world, right? So you have to have a thirst for knowledge, but that doesn't mean you have to go through a traditional education system to be successful. Let me add one point to that for, for the listeners. And I'm stealing this from my one of my, well, really my main mentor right now, this guy, Jeff Lerner, who runs the, the Institute I'm a part. But think about this, okay? For a Harvard graduation, or Harvard graduate rather, to go to Harvard, costs about 50 grand a semester or, or, or a year. You're looking at about $200,000, up, upward to $300,000, right, to go to Harvard. This, uh, you might know this, you might not, but when I heard this, it's a holy shit. In your mid thirties, after graduating from Harvard, the average yearly salary is eighty-two to eighty-four thousand dollars. 
that is asinine the fact that you can be making that and and let's flip that on its ass that's what a lot of these professors that are teaching you for two hundred thousand dollars there's these so-called experts in their field when you could go learn on your own the same knowledge and actually learn from people that are doing it for a living and again we're not bashing college i'm not it's not what we're talking about it's just to open your mind to other possibilities <laughs> you know it's funny you say that about. so the tagline um, of it, my it, coaching it, business is paved in possibility yeah nice nice i love it that's really what it's all about because you're think about our parents and our grandparents right we're you know similar in age this is so alien to them they're, they're still stuck in that mentality and so was our system so our, as our, our, our educational system and a lot of early systems they're still stuck in that old mentality because of things like moore's law and the way technology advances and evolves it's hard to keep up but it's i'm telling you guys for the audience make sure you're looking at the other end on, on the cutting edge that's where real freedom and success is at not and you can go to college and be happy and live that life if you'd like but if you want to be free that's not the most ideal route let me switch gears i want to because i want to really dive into this i'm curious how you feel about this um and one quick question about your your real estate ventures what would you say is your is it uh you know single double family homes is it duplexes what is your main source of uh you know your inventory what, what do you kind of sell the most of it with your business Okay. Regardless, I, I'm sure you have an opinion on this. And I'm curious. Anybody in real estate probably knows more than I do about it, but I'm curious. With uh, mm-hmm. the whole COVID thing, right? And this, I don't think this is ever going to go back because, and this is the reason why, it, it, not just a bend in the system. Some things are broken. A lot of companies and CEOs and, and people who control the money are realizing we're actually going to get more output and with a higher efficiency from some people working at home and not having 80,000 square foot, you know, 100 foot offices for to house our employees. So that's really going to take a huge chunk out of the real estate industry and I don't know if that's something that's come across your radar but it's already starting to happen in cities like New York obviously it's just mass amounts of, of people fleeing and exodus in the city and a lot of these places are all these rents rental you know revenues are not going to be coming back. Uh, it's a little bit different for the you know single families and things like that but has that has that been something that you I guys mean, have absolutely. discussed and it's been on your radar or any opinions right? on that never predicted what was going to happen in 08 09 that will right. not happen again everybody's like the housing market the housing market well what happened in 08 09 if you study what happened it was because of predatory lending circumstances right COVID is more of like a right. almost more right. compared to a natural disaster um, than than anything else, right? So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yes, it's going to change the landscape. Do we know how? No, we can predict how, but you know, if anything, right now, yes, people are working from home, um, myself included, right? I'm kind of like doing this hybrid thing in the office at home, and I'm an agent anyways. I don't stay in a house longer than two years, mm-hmm. so. I'm already itching to move again. And now I'm like, okay, I need to have a space for my kids to have a school zone. I need to have uh, my home office. If anything, it's reconfiguring our space and being creative with our space so we can make it work for our home life. But, you know, the one thing that we don't get more of is land. We can't make more land. (laughs) All right. So in inventory is so low right now it's going to continue to drive up the prices of houses and inventory will still remain low i believe throughout 2021 and possibly forever (laughs) It, it you know they're not building enough homes to keep up with the population it doesn't work and there will always be um the the people that want to live in a city that's not going to go away even with covid Right. People are still going to want to live in a city. I can tell you, though, yeah. there are a lot more millennials moving back home with their parents right now um, than ever before. So, you know, it, it the, what's going to happen in the housing market? You can ask five different high level people and get five different answers. Um, right. Everybody has their own predictions from it. All we can do is study the market today. And this I do know the market changes every day and there are micro markets. It's not just we look at all of this national statistics. Well, if you're living in Michigan, national statistics don't do you any good. And if like for me, for instance, I live in St. Clair Shores. So looking at the market in Oakland County doesn't do me any good. There's micro there's a micro market and there's a macro market. There's a luxury market right. for anything over five hundred thousand dollars. There's 
always going to be a market for the hundred thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand dollar houses. Those will always turn and burn. The luxury market always puts the brakes on first, right? Most of the time. So you mm-hmm. know, you, you got to know what you're looking for. You got to know the markets. You got to know the cities because everything is is different in Metro Detroit. <coughs> Excuse me. I think. Take away there, and this is with really anything in life, whatever your business or you're trying to tackle, you got to be adaptable. I like what you said there, kind of you said re- reconfigure your space and your home life to adapt to the the changing environment. That's if if everybody could do that, you'd have a much higher chance of success in your life. And when you become rigid and you become you know job security and you think that's a real thing, uh, yeah, that that's very very smart. And you're right; it doesn't matter if you're doing real estate or looking at the housing market or looking at the stock market or whatever you're doing. You got to be adaptable, especially now. And re- sadly, that's why a lot of people are having such a hard time during this whatever you want to call it, this weird year, this transformative so, phase, whatever you want to call it. It's not just people about being so stuck, stuck in their ways. Okay, so you know? if you go ahead, look go at ahead. How- we as humans, it's in our DNA for our basic needs, okay? And I, I call it S squared, C squared. Um, people like stability. They like certainty. They like to feel connected. And they like to feel significant, all right? So you can take that and plug that into mm-hmm. a relationship, a friendship, a business partnership, the current state of the last 24 hours, 48 hours since election day, right? There's no certainty. Everybody's like, what? Same thing with COVID. There's no certainty. What's happening? What we don't, we don't like the unknown. We like to function in a space of security. So when you look at those things and those are all off kilter, that's when people start acting, um, you know, maybe not so much from a sound mind, but they're acting from fear. That's so funny you said that. I was just thinking a minute ago, you know, it's the real growth in life 100%. is where you do what's uncomfortable, right? And you you attack your fears. That's that's where you grow. And this is that time where maybe, you, maybe I did kind of misspoke. It's where people who decided to embrace the fear and dig down into that instead of looking into themselves for inspiration and to help other people. You know, I, that's that's it right there. You can be consumed by fear, whatever you're doing, right? Asking a girl out, trying to, you know, ask for a raise, trying to get that that deal, whatever it is. You know, I'm starting to really embrace that. You can't have fear. And I meant to say something earlier too. You got to remove your ego. That's been something that's such so striking to me lately. You can't grow and learn every single second of every day if your ego is just so stuck where it thinks you're. You have all the yeah. answers and all Did that. It's just, it, it's so wrong. So, but I, I love the fear. I, <laughs> I did. And I meant to bring that up. Actually, it's, it's too funny. I, I just was scrolling through and saw that I screenshot it, meant to bring it up. Yeah, that, that yeah, was so fantastic. I was I, uh, if you want to talk so about I that for a minute. I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Wayne Dwyer. Go ahead. Right? So, um, I have, uh, I read two yep, devotional yep. books. One's based in the Bible. And then my other one is from Dr. Wayne Dwyer. And I read both of them this morning and they were so on point, but this one just kind of resonated with me a little bit, you know, with all of the Facebook posts that I've been seeing since Tuesday. So oh, it's fantastic. it says, become a person who refuses to be offended by anyone, anything, or any set of circumstances. If something takes place and you disapprove, by all means, state what you feel from your heart. And if possible, work to eliminate it and then let it go. Most people operate from the ego and really need to be right. So when you encounter someone saying things that you find inappropriate, or when you know they're wrong, 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 forget your need to be right and instead say, you're right about that. Those words will end potential conflict and free you from being offended. Your desire is to be peaceful, not to be right, hurt, angry, or resentful. If you have enough faith in your own beliefs, you'll find that it's impossible to be offended by the beliefs and conducts of others. Mic drop, right? So there's a statement in there, though, that that says that, you know, if something takes place and you disapprove, by all means, state what you feel from your heart. Okay, many people state what they feel from a place of anger and resentment. If you got quiet for a minute and listened to what was in your heart, you'd be surprised by the words that came out of your mouth. Absolutely. And it's funny, people also will 
knee-jerk reaction with whatever the group think is or whatever they've been told. But if you really dig down and get away with that fear and ego, right? It's it really struck me. I love that. I, and I'm actually going to take that and not steal it, but I might even link that to the episode. That was uh, it was fantastic. I, I really, really kind of hit me hard. And uh, the whole idea of not being right and you know not getting offended, right? Or, or worrying about offending people. I posted a few days ago in the group I met about this exact thing we're talking about. I had an interesting interaction with uh, another user. And this is just a real quick story, but we just did not click right away. You know, I was just speaking from my mind. Something didn't seem right. He maybe didn't quite like the reaction. We had a little bit of a civil discourse and went about our business. But will I ever work with that person? Probably not. But it was an interesting case of, look, we both could have been, you know, it might have been a little bit of uh, whatever you want to call it, but having the emotional maturity. Yeah, yeah, of course, everybody, we all have it. It doesn't go away. You just learn how to put it aside and and keep going forward and do the right thing. This has been amazing. I I wish, you know, I've mentioned this to everybody and you also, because I'm curious and I want to ask you a question about this in a minute, but maybe in a few months or six months, I'll have to have you back and see where you're at. But speaking of that, um, to talk a little bit more about you and what you're doing and your future plans where people can find you or to learn more about you and your coaching business. What, aside from, you know, getting your, your links right now, your info, what do you got going on over the next, you know, what's your, what's your five-year plan? <laughs> what's, what, what do you want to do yeah, great question. Uh, with so, this next phase of your you life? Know, I, um, I, in five years, I have been able to six tuple my income in five years. I want to do that again in the next five years, um, you know, so that will compound. And I, I've learned over the last uh, few years about who I am and who I'm choosing to become. And one of the things I know about me is that I have a gypsy soul. I love adventure and I love to travel. So I am setting myself up now to be able to um, have passive income and still have my my job, right? My human capital, because that's where I get uh, my joy. I, I can tell you my values uh, in my career space and in what I do every day to earn my income are purpose, impact, growth, and authenticity. So whatever I do will be, will fill those four buckets up. And I want to work anywhere my laptop and my Wi-Fi and my phone are. So my son graduates in three years. So I will be the, the mobile coach, the teacher, the trainer, um, from either Jackson Hole, Wyoming, mm-hmm. or the Caribbean, or Alberta, Canada, wherever I want to go, um, and I will fit um, my people and work around what I choose to do. I don't want to have that the other way. <laughs> Life is meant to be enjoyed. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. I hope everybody heard that and has been listening to Amy because. It- Everything you said has been so valuable. And again, this isn't nope. this isn't about becoming a millionaire or being a digital marketer or running a real estate business. It's about living a fulfilled life. And notice I didn't say happy life because you can be happy at a certain time, but to really feel fulfillment, you got to find your calling. And it's not like, Amy, it's not like you did some, you just stuck to your heart. You follow where you wanted to go. You took some risks in life. You didn't let some mistakes you had or maybe a bad marriage or some some issues you had slow well, you down. You just kept minute, going though. forward. And look got, what's going on. I mean, I can go You're back talking and about... dissect where I was and where I came from and how I have unearthed myself. Um, and, you know, I I did, I and I have no regrets about it, by the way. There's no judgment around it. I have given myself grace and I have forgiven myself. Um, I think that's a huge piece. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I, and I could tell that that's really what I mean. We'll you you could go into time. that if you'd like that, that part, and but I, I could, yeah, yeah, because that could be another hour. But I guess what I, and I don't want to just glaze over, and I, I want to dive into it, and I want to respect your time. But that I could tell. Look, not all, not all, but some. I interviewed a guy recently who really had no major problems when you know growing up and, and a really good life and a bunch of cousins. It was awesome. Like didn't have a you know horror story, but a lot of people that find success later in life. Yeah deal with some crazy shit when they're younger. I did. And and, and again, no, success so isn't I, just a big bank account. It's about feeling fulfilled about success and not having to worry. And he says that success is mm-hmm. the progressive realization of a worthy goal or ideal. Okay? So it is the man who runs the corner gas station because that was his dream. 
that's what he wanted to do. So if you actualize mm-hmm. the vision that you have in your head about what you want to do, that is success. Success is not attached to a dollar amount at all. It's not attached to another person. It is attached to what fills nope. up your cup and what gives you joy. Yep. And you know, you make those little commitments to yourself, right? Once you keep doing those, if you're in a dark place or this sounds like too much right now, just one day at a time. They will start to build up, it'll compound. You'll go back to the same spot you were in a difficult task. It'll be a lot easier in a week. Just keep going at it, right? It's people just get stuck and they and they give up. You can't do that. If we all just don't do that. Trust be a part of the the people who find fulfillment. Don't don't get stuck and live that life. I I I beg you guys listening because Amy's a great example. Um, and I do want to have you back. Uh, I'm curious about how this is going to develop. And uh, one more question for you. I'd like to kind of leave with this and maybe for the part of you that I did not hear about a time where you might've been low or, or needed some advice. What would you tell your former self at that low point that would help you kind of get to where you are now faster? Was there something you needed to know for listeners or people who are at a low point or need some advice on how to pull themselves out of that? Oh my gosh, there's, get going? there's so many places anything, I can go Anything for that. the audience? One of my mantras, one of, one of my mantras is that <laughs> right, you right. are capable of whatever you set your mind to, right? Henry Ford said it best, whether you think you're right or you're wrong, you are, you're right, right? So absolutely. Like, And then on top of that, though, once you set something, your mindset is like a muscle. You have to work it. You can't just say you want to do something and then sit on the couch and eat bonbons. It doesn't work that way, right? So get some affirmations. (laughs) How do you start your day in the morning? How do you, your power up and your power down is so important. How do you, what do you listen to at night? And how do you set your mind and your subconscious before you go to bed? And then what do you choose to listen to as soon as you wake up? And how do you start your day, right? We have such a tendency to to wake up and grab our phone. Right, Put that right. shit down. Go outside. Listen to the birds chirp. I watch you follow me on Facebook. You should know my favorite thing to do in the morning is go watch the sunrise. My goal is to move three blocks east so I can be on the lake mm-hmm. and watch the sunrise every morning. It's what I love it. It just sets my tone. It's like there's something so centering around watching the sunrise because it's like I I birth myself every morning, right? I I get a new start, a fresh start every day. So, you know, in your your input, the best ROI you'll ever get is on yourself. What are you listening to? What are you ingesting? What kind of thoughts are you choosing to let drive your day, right? So, you know, think of how you're growing yourself and invest in yourself. And I don't mean necessarily with money. If you're broke, you're broke right now, but listen to podcasts, go to YouTube, listen to Tony Robbins, Darren Hardy, fill your cup up with the right things and surround yourself with the right people. And sometimes you need to take a hard look in the mirror and cut some people out of your life because they're not supporting you on your journey. That last part right there, Amy, I uh, damn near made me emotional because it's been the toughest thing to do. And it almost happened <laughs> with my fiance. And I don't care if she hears this, she, she knows what's going on. It was it was one of those moments. And you are right. It, anybody who's listening to this podcast, go back, rewind about a minute and a half. Listen to everything Amy just said about four or five times. If you do that, especially the part about what are you thinking? What are you filling your mind with both in your internal thoughts And what external forces are you allowing into your brain? I can't tell you how important and impactful it was when every spare moment I had driving in my car, on the treadmill, running, any free moment where I could listen to whatever podcast. It's changed my life. I've listened to like a bajillion in a few months time. And I've learned more than I could even tell you in in a thousand hours sitting here. It's been overwhelmingly awesome. And yeah, it's it's all about what you put in your head. So I'm going to let what you just said kind of sit there again go back and listen to that that was perfect i i can't and i want to hear more about your coaching we'll talk offline i'll get you back on here um you might even <laughs> see me as, as one of your clients you never know one day and i'd like to maybe work with you one day as well and and see and uh, I, I again if, if people want to find you if you want to and i'm going to put all this below so you know you don't have to give your entire email email address but if you have a simple website or or even if you want to give your, your social media uh, yeah, contacts, I mean, I'm, the I'm floor is yours to put yourself platforms. out there. Um, my name's kind of lengthy. It's Amy Osterbeck, uh, which is O-S-T-E-R-B as in boy, E-C-K. My email is mm. super easy. It's amyo at kw.com. 
um, feel free if you have any questions or need resources. I always um, tell people I don't have to be the resource, but I'm super resourceful. Uh, I like to play match.com for people. Like if you need something, I will <laughs> put you in contact with who has it. Love it. That's great. That's a great resource to have. So I hope everybody heard that. And I will I'll put your links below. Uh, make sure I you know, get that out there for people. And Amy, this has been awesome. You know, wasn't sure what to expect. It's been 20, 30 years since we've talked, but this has been amazing. And uh, I, again, I'd like to have you back maybe even sooner um, now that I know a little more about you and you're, I'm kind of going into what you're already doing and being a coach. And we, this can maybe even be a recurring thing. Talk about stuff we learn and find out and where we're going and all that. But yeah, I this has been fantastic. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Amy, again. Thank you, listeners. Right, and sir, uh, thank this you. has been I awesome. And yeah, we'll, we'll talk again soon. Thanks.